substantial number, uh, they're put out of circulation. Uh, that serves as a deterrent to others who might be tempted to uh, go along the same path. So if the government does that uh, and succeeds, then the uh, average citizen doesn't have to be greatly concerned uh, with uh, being the victim of crime. The government is making him free of uh, depredations by criminals. And if at the same time the government is limited to that, that's all it's doing, then the citizen doesn't have to be afraid of the government either. Well, then what are you able to do if you don't have to worry about being the victim of physical force either by your neighbors or by the government? But you, have, you yourself, of course, are prohibited from uh, initiating force. And now here you are, you would like to pursue your material well-being. You want to make your life materially better. Well, what sorts of things will you have to do? What will uh, define the limits of your action and the character of your action? Yes. I mean, from what I read, it was basically your material freedom is if you want a car. If you don't have a car, you want a car. If you have one car, you go for two cars. All right. Or an airplane or a boat. Or okay. Increasing to your material wealth. Okay. And how would you obtain that? How are you attempting to obtain? Uh, you're interested in a higher standard of living, aren't you? Uh, how are you going about doing that? Yes. You're selling, you're selling your skills to the highest bidder. Uh, you're selling your skills to the highest bidder, and at the same time, you're attempting to augment your skills, right? Uh, presumably, that's why you're in an MBA program. You want to uh, augment your skills. You want to make yourself more marketable and earn a higher income by doing that. Now, uh, what about uh, the the companies that you're working for? Uh, how are they, uh, by and large? attempting to improve their profitability. Getting the greatest return on investment? Well, how are they attempting to do that? They want the greatest return on investment. They'd like to have a greater return uh, than they do now, or they want to maintain the, if they have a good return, they want to maintain it in the face of competition. So uh, what sorts of things do they have to do? Increase their productivity. They have to improve their productivity. They have to come up with improved products or uh, lower cost methods of producing the products they are producing. Uh, they have to uh, anticipate uh, changes in consumer demand and uh, have uh, the things the consumers want uh, when they want them. So uh, they're attempting uh, to gear their activities, uh, they're attempting to do things that will induce uh, customers voluntarily to buy from them on a larger scale or uh, to uh, cut their costs of production. Uh, they're attempting uh, to improve, uh, to offer things in the market that uh, more people want or will be willing to pay higher prices for and at the same time uh, to uh, improve their efficiency, produce at lower costs. And to the extent they succeed in doing that, uh, they can earn a greater income. Well, now, uh, to the extent they do that, what's the effect on, uh, on the uh, people they're dealing with? See, we can see that to the extent you succeed, that's very good for you. But uh, if you're succeeding uh, by offering a better product in the market, what's the effect on the buyers of the product? Receiving a product. They're receiving a better product. Uh, if you're uh, producing more efficiently at a lower cost, well, uh, ultimately, uh, what's going to be the effect on the price uh, that the buyers will pay? That will go down. Now, you see, uh, you have to realize that uh, when uh, firms introduce improvements and they increase their own profits, uh, almost always they have competitors. And even if they didn't have any existing competitors, if uh, some lines of business become exceptionally profitable, as soon as others get wind of this, uh, they'll try to duplicate it. Uh, a recent example from all the commercials we see, uh, first there's Viagra, uh, then there's, uh, what's the next one, Levitra, uh, then there's a third one, maybe a fourth one. 
So uh, what's the effect of that on the profits of Viagra? When it gets uh, this pile of competitors, it goes down. Or uh, more importantly, here's Intel. Uh, they come out uh, years ago with an 8286 chip, and that's the hottest thing in the market, uh, circa 1984, 1985. But how long does the 8286 chip remain the hottest thing in the market? Not very long. Others are doing it. Uh, then what does Intel have to do? Come out with the 8386. And uh, people are cutting their costs. Uh, back in the 19th century at some point, uh, I think uh, uh, Carnegie Steel uh, may have introduced the Bessemer process uh, in the United States steel industry. And that represented a significant cost-saving improvement. Well, uh, what happened uh, when uh, steel generally came to be produced by that more advanced method? then the price of steel reflected the lower cost. And then uh, to make money through efficiency, you had to have greater efficiencies. So uh, anytime uh, anyone is introducing improvements, uh, his motive is to improve his own profits. But at the same time, he has to offer better products to the buyers, uh, more efficient methods of production, uh, which will ultimately be passed on to the buyers. So what's the effect of that uh, profit seeking uh, on the general standard of living. It's driving it forward. That's how the standard of living goes up. Just think of uh, why it was practically anything that we take for granted invented and then improved in all the ways it was improved. It's the profit motive. Uh, the profit motive leads to uh, newer, better products and more efficient methods of producing whatever exists. And that's what's uh, continually raising the standard of living. Now, you see, uh, this is uh, the pursuit of self-interest under freedom. Uh, when you're attempting uh, to uh, earn more money and uh, the one thing you're not allowed to do is initiate the use of force. And the only way you can then make more money is with the voluntary cooperation of the people you deal with. That means in order for you to make more money, you have to benefit the buyers of your products. And you have to uh, produce them more efficiently. And you have to benefit uh, everyone who's dealing with you. Just think, if you cannot resort to force or fraud against people, how do you get them to deal with you? Make it a benefit. Pardon me? Make it a benefit. You have to make it a benefit to them. In order for you to benefit uh, in your dealings, uh, if, if you have to deal with people voluntarily, uh, you have to see to it that they benefit. And this is one of the uh, enormously important insights of Adam Smith back in the 18th century. He said, uh, the nature of every bargain is that uh, in order for uh, me to benefit, I have to see to it that you also benefit. Both parties uh, in a freely conducted bargain benefit. There's uh, a harmony of self-interest. Uh, this is one of the tremendous insights of Smith and the classical economists, that the self-interests of people could be harmonious. Now that is only true uh, provided they cannot resort to physical force against one another. That they have to deal with one another on a voluntary basis. If people are to deal with one another voluntarily, it has to be on the basis of mutual benefit. And then you have uh, self-interest acting as this enormously powerful engine of progress. So it makes all the difference whether or not uh, you can resort to force. If you can't, if you cannot resort to force, if that's the one thing you can't do, but you do wish to promote your self-interest, you do want to serve your material self-interest, well, what do you have to do? You have to produce benefits. You have to produce better, more efficient products. 
then you do serve your self-interest by doing that, but at the same time, what are you doing to the self-interest of those who deal with you? They're promoting it as well. Uh, this is what makes the profit motive the tremendous uh, engine of progress that it is. But it, it's a life and death difference whether or not you can promote your self-interest by force or are prohibited from doing that. See, we're talking, when we talk about the profit motive and capitalism in positive, and glowing terms even, it's always on the understanding that uh, you are prohibited from using physical force. You're prohibited from initiating force. That means you have to promote your self-interest uh, by introducing improvements, by serving the self-interest of those you deal with at the same time. Now, if you remove this constraint on force, then all bets are off. And there are lots of people who try to promote their self-interest by using force. And what's a good classic illustration? Protection uh, the protection racket. The mafia can stand as a good uh, representation of uh, the attempt to promote self-interest by force. Uh, they sell protection, uh, they have stick-ups, uh, criminal activity in general. Uh, a bank robber wants to uh, uh, get a lot of loot, uh, but how does he do it? Uh, he goes and he robs the bank. Now, that's not promoting anybody's self-interest. Now, unfortunately, there's tremendous confusion uh, many, many people, when they think of self-interest, when they think of the profit motive, greed, whatever, uh, they're not making any distinction between the attempt to serve your self-interest in peaceful, voluntary trade or through force. Uh, they're not seeing the distinction. And they think uh, there really is no such distinction. And many, many people, unfortunately, hold uh, what you can describe as a mafioso view of self-interest. They think the way you serve self-interest is you go and rob banks, uh, have a protection racket, uh, engage in con games, whatever. That's their concept of self-interest. And any time they hear uh, people are pursuing their self-interest, uh, they want to make the greatest possible profits, well, they think uh, we're talking about mafioso. And I think uh, this mindset uh, explains a tremendous part of the hostility uh, to business and profits. People are thinking of business as uh, some kind of, of mafioso. Now, uh, things can be very, very confused. Uh, it's possible uh, for any given individual uh, at one time or another uh, uh, to act in an improper way. Uh, you might have someone uh, who for 99% of his career is pursuing his self-interest uh, strictly through voluntary trade, uh, mutual benefit, but there could be 1% uh, where he breaches that. And maybe that, nowadays, uh, maybe that's true uh, to some degree uh, of everybody. And what makes it particularly confusing is uh, the kinds of laws that uh, can be passed. Uh, suppose, for example, you have a uh, software company or computer company, and uh, its regular normal operations are it's uh, uh, introducing better software or uh, more powerful computers or whatever. Uh, it's functioning uh, normally in a proper, highly productive way. But there might be some occasion that comes up uh, they decide to uh, make generous political contributions uh, to get some uh, law passed or some rider tacked on to a law that will uh, prohibit other people from competing with them. Uh, let's take the American steel industry. Uh, I'm sure uh, almost all of the time, day in and day out, uh, the American steel industry is trying to make profit uh, by producing high quality steel, even better steel than they are producing, and to do it more efficiently than they are. But sometimes uh, they encounter uh, some competition that they feel they can't meet, like foreign steel, 
and then uh, they make generous political contributions and they'll get a special uh, tariff prohibition enacted against their foreign competitors. Well, what stops the foreign competitors uh, from selling in the face of the uh, added tariff burden? Well, what is it that compels them uh, to, uh, to pay the higher tariff? Suppose we have Nippon Steel, let's say, and it's uh, sending its steel over in freighters. Uh, what would happen if uh, the freighters dock and the customs agents are there and uh, uh, the people on the vessel say, oh, we're just unloading our steel, we're not paying uh, the higher tariff. The forced. Then they'd be forced, the Coast Guard would probably be out with a gunboat or whatever. Uh, they would have to pay, they don't have a choice. Uh, they would be forced uh, to act in violation of the law. Uh, the law represents force. But now just think, is sending your goods uh, to some country, is that an act of force? Are you initiating force when you send your goods somewhere? No, but if you're stopped, uh, there's an initiation of force. The initiation is your, is your being stopped. Now, uh, we have uh, business firms. Normally, uh, they're engaged in pursuing profit uh, by perfectly proper, positive means. But uh, time and again, uh, they turn to the government uh, for such a thing as a tariff, a special subsidy, uh, maybe launching some legal action against a competitor. Uh, and when they do that, uh, then uh, they're pursuing their self-interest uh, along the lines of the people who are using brass knuckles. So uh, it becomes very, very mixed. Now, while it may be mixed in practice, while, it, while it's entirely possible that every single business in the country today uh, is uh, guilty of some kind of uh, attempt to benefit uh, from the initiation of force, uh, analytically, we can still make a very sharp, clear distinction. And we can say that uh, this kind of business activity is very positive and proper, uh, raising the standard of living of everyone. And then there are other activities uh, which are working the opposite way. And the, uh, <coughs> uh, and the ultimate application would be uh, to minimize or totally eliminate uh, the instances in which businesses uh, can be responsible or feel they need to be responsible for initiating force and instead uh, let them pursue their, their profit motive strictly by introducing better products, more efficient methods of production. Now, if to the extent that you have uh, the profit motive and pursuit of self-interest operating under freedom to the extent that the initiation of force is prohibited and minimized, well then you have this incredibly powerful positive engine of progress. And that's uh, essentially what we established uh, with the founding of the United States, at least for the white male population, uh, there was greater freedom than at any previous time in history. Now just project, uh, what would people do, uh, say starting back around 1790, a year after the Constitution was enacted, two years after? Here you are, uh, you're living uh, in, the, in New England or the Middle Atlantic states, uh, somewhere uh, more or less on the eastern seaboard, and you want to improve your material well-being. Well, what would be a good way for many people to do that at that time? Move west. Uh, lay claim uh, to land that is essentially just uninhabited. No one has made any fixed claims to it. It's uh, largely empty forest. And so they start clearing trees, pulling out stumps and roots, and establishing farms. They're, they're moving west, and they're establishing private property and land. They're appropriating land from nature. Uh, their pursuit of self-interest lay in the appropriation of land from nature. Now, if they're free, 
And if at the same time uh, they think long range, uh, they and they they recognize themselves as uh, effective causal agents. And some of this relates back uh, to point two, the philosophical foundations of capitalism and economic activity. If people perceive themselves as capable of achieving effects, long-term effects, and they're free, they don't have to worry about their neighbors confiscating their land, they don't have to worry about the government confiscating it, and they want to benefit themselves, and they think long-range, then they start doing things in the present that will improve their productivity uh, 10, 20, 30 years in the future. That's why uh, these farmers would clear the land, pull out the rocks, the stumps, uh, drain land, uh, irrigate it, uh, one thing and another. They're taking action in the present uh, to benefit themselves in a fairly distant future. And that is an important, uh, uh, simple form of saving and capital accumulation. They labor in the present to benefit in the future. And then that carries over uh, why uh, do people start saving in their 20s and 30s uh, to provide for themselves uh, in their 60s and 70s? Well, what are uh, the preconditions of doing that? Pardon me? Yeah, you have to trust that uh, you can that you will own what you're saving, that it won't be seized from you, uh, that uh, it, it will not be robbed uh, by envious neighbors, and the government will not confiscate you. And if people uh, have that conviction and at the same time uh, they do think long range, uh, their mentality, uh, the culture that they live in uh, favors uh, long range thinking, being aware of the future and the present, well, uh, then acting for your material self-interest means you save and invest. And that's uh, a major precondition of economic progress and prosperity. Now, uh, we can threaten that uh, today. Uh, if anyone is saving, let's say, $1,000 in a given year, uh, if that $1,000 uh, is going into an investment that will pay uh, a certain number of dollars, suppose you're going to put up $1,000, uh, you're, you're saving $1,000 uh, uh, buying some type of bond or other fixed income security. Well, what do you think is going to be the buying power of $1,000 in 30 years? Almost certainly much less. The only question is, how much less? Well, uh, how does such a situation uh, affect the extent to which people will save and provide for the future, the extent to which they can uh, serve their self-interest by saving and providing for the future if the buying power of money uh, cannot be assumed? If all you can assume is that it will be less, but how much less? Well, to the extent we have a monetary system uh, where people cannot trust the buying power, how must that affect saving and serving your self-interest by means of saving? It has to undermine it. It's a, a very serious uh, impairment. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk and discussion uh, how low the rate of savings is. And I think a very, very major reason is that we have a monetary unit whose buying power you can't trust. And uh, if you're attempting to save in any form that will come back as a fixed number of dollars, well, you really have no idea uh, what that's going to be worth or how important that will be, how valuable it will be. Now, if we wanted people to be able to serve their self-interest by saving and providing for the future and doing so uh, in terms of uh, contractually fixed numbers of dollars, what would we have to do about the monetary unit? Well, we'd have to have a monetary unit whose uh, buying power would not perpetually shrink. We'd have to have a different kind of monetary unit than we now do. 
Now, uh, the monetary unit that we have today, uh, I assume you're all familiar with the idea that uh, the value of anything uh, depends on its scarcity or lack of scarcity, its scarcity or abundance. Uh, what limits uh, the supply of paper dollars? They can be printed or just manufactured by uh, entries on, on the books. Uh, someone can hit some computer keys and money can come into, into being in immense quantities. Well, uh, what do you think the ability to create money without limit, what effect must that have on the prospective buying power of money? It, it undercuts it. It threatens it. Now, if you wanted to have a monetary unit that people could trust, you would have to have a monetary unit whose quantity could not be arbitrarily increased. You'd have to have a monetary unit that could be increased only with very considerable difficulty. That would be a monetary unit whose buying power could be trusted. Any notion of possible candidates? Diamonds, gold. Gold. Gold uh, is the traditional monetary unit, and the uh, main reason for th the advantages of gold is that governments uh, have never mastered the art of alchemy, and so they can't destroy the value of gold but they can easily destroy the value of paper that they can create without limit. Well, uh, that's uh, a whole other major discussion. But notice uh, the, the main point is that uh, if people are left to pursue their self-interest uh, under the one fundamental constraint that they can't do so by means of initiating force, then there are all kinds of ways to pursue your self-interest that are positive and profoundly beneficial. Uh, introducing new and improved products, more efficient methods of production, and before that, uh, appropriating land and natural resources from nature, saving and providing for the future. In fact, uh, the totality of our economic development, I think, can be understood in terms of the principle of individuals pursuing their peaceful self-interest. That's what led to the settlement of the West. That's why people moved West, established farms. Uh, why did uh, merchants follow the farmers and open stores to supply them? That was profitable for them. That's how they served their self-interest. Why did other people uh, begin stagecoach lines, then barge lines, and later on railroads, and still later uh, open gas stations, uh, produce automobiles. Uh, why, have, why all of these improvements uh, in the means of transportation? What led people uh, to carry them out, to look for them and implement them? Their desire uh, to serve their self-interest. That's the profit motive for them. Why did other people uh, uh, open, build factories and uh, invent the equipment that went into them and improve the equipment and the products they'd be producing. What motivated them? Profit. The profit motive, again. Uh, why did other people uh, who are born on farms decide that they'd be better off working in towns and cities and in, in the new factories that were being built rather than staying on the farms? That was their self-interest. Uh, what led uh, little insignificant towns to grow into major cities? How did that happen? Do you think there were uh, government bureaus that said, ah, here's uh, Fort Detroit, uh, has a couple of hundred people. Uh, we need to have a big city there. And so we'll round up the, the serfs and put them in Detroit. Uh, how do you think uh, all of the different cities grew? It was individuals, one at a time, making decisions. Uh, this was uh, the best place for me to be at the time. Uh, the, the reason for practically everything occurring was uh, the pursuit of material self-interest under freedom. And literally, uh, in the space of about 100 years, from 1776 to 1876, it led to uh, the development of uh, the North American continent. And of course, it's uh, gone on 
uh, ever since. And this is uh, the great uh, powerful engine of uh, material self-interest. And I think uh, we can see it at work uh, very powerfully uh, despite a lot of impediments and uh, a lot of, uh, of wrong, wrongful type pursuit of self-interest uh, going on in China today. Uh, they were getting nowhere under the uh, Mao Zedong regime, but uh, they finally recognized that what they needed to do was unleash material self-interest, and uh, to a very, very substantial degree, by no means completely, uh, I'm sure with uh, more uh, negatives mixed in than we have here, uh, they've succeeded in uh, very, very substantial uh, economic development. Uh, but th that's the secret, uh, turning people free to pursue their material self-interest. Now, as I say, uh, many, many people uh, have great, great difficulty in distinguishing uh, between the pursuit of material self-interest by positive, productive means and brass knuckles. And uh, again and again, uh, they think there's no distinction. And that's uh, the most fateful error that, that could be made, I think, uh, in economics. Because if, if you believe that the way self-interest is achieved is through brass knuckles, well, uh, what happens uh, to the extent that people are out attempting to achieve their self-interest that way? In effect, through robbery. So it undermines the system. Now, just notice, any time there's a robbery, whatever the robber gains, the victim must lose, right? <coughs> there's no net gain, obviously. But now, if robbery becomes a common large-scale phenomenon, how does that affect what the potential victims produce? How much are people going to produce if they know the likelihood is that when they produced it, they'll be robbed? They won't produce it. So the consequence of robbery as a widespread social phenomenon is that it actually works against the general self-interest. Not only is it the case that what the robbers gain, the victims equivalently lose, but there is that much less to be robbed. Now, this is why uh, the feudal era was so miserably poor. Under feudalism, each uh, feudal principality was attempting to live by plundering its neighbors. Now, when everyone is attempting to live by plundering everybody else, how much is there to plunder? There's just not all that much to plunder. So that becomes a very stupid, self-defeating policy. No one can succeed in those conditions. And this is why uh, many uh, writers have said uh, that... Uh, such a thing is really not self-interest. It's not rational self-interest. It's irrational, contradictory, self-defeating self-interest. It really shouldn't even be thought of as self-interest. The notion that uh, you serve your self-interest through robbery and plunder uh, when uh, generalized is entirely self-defeating. And uh, it's self-defeating in another respect, too. Uh, suppose we have people who believe that the way they can serve their self-interest, if they could get away with it, is uh, through robbery. They believe that that's how they could serve their self-interest if they could get away with it. Now, that becomes the general attitude in a society that uh, the way self-interest can be achieved is through robbery. Uh, even if each individual thinks, well, it's okay for me to steal if I can get away with it. I won't tell anyone that I think that, but... Uh, if I can get away with it, that'll be good for me. What attitude would you expect to exist uh, toward the pursuit of self-interest by anybody else? Suppose you believe, suppose we have someone who believes that the way you serve your self-interest is through robbery. And you reserve the right to rob to yourself. You say, I'll rob because uh, that's to my self-interest. I won't announce that. And what I'll tell the world is... Uh, I would never dream of serving my self-interest. I'm a doormat for the rest of mankind to walk on. I wish to serve everybody. Uh, that's my goal. But secretly, I reserve the right to uh, commit robbery. 
if people believe that, uh, what will be their attitude toward the pursuit of self-interest by everybody else? Well, if you think that self-interest means uh, you, you rob to serve it, even if you reserve it to yourself, do you want anyone else to do it? No. no. Now imagine we have a society, all of the members of which believe the way you serve your self-interest is through robbery. What do you think will be the extent to which self-interest can be openly, publicly pursued? It will be impossible. Everyone will be saying, I don't want anyone to pursue their self-interest because that's robbery. You'll be killing me. But at the same time, they can believe that that's how they serve their self-interest. Just imagine you have a society uh, comprised mainly of people who think the way you serve your self-interest is through robbing other people. Now, if they're not psychotic, are they going to uh, announce that attitude? Is someone going to say, I, I think the way I would benefit if I wanted to benefit is by robbing all of you. How often will you find someone who will say, who will get up openly and say, uh, I think I'll benefit if I can rob all of you? What would be the, the attitude they project in public? if they think self-interest means robbery, are they going to uh, present themselves as pro-self-interest? No, because if they're equating self-interest with robbery, uh, you don't want to announce that you're a robber or uh, could easily be one. So the public attitude towards self-interest will be entirely negative. But what about the private secret attitude? What happens in those moments when you may decide yeah, I'd like to serve my self-interest. If you think that that self-interest means robbery, that you have the only way you can serve your self-interest is by robbing others, well, what will happen in those moments when you think of serving your self-interest or decide that you really wish to serve your self-interest? You'll be a robber. You'll be a robber. Now, don't we observe the phenomenon of politicians who is public career is one of selfless service to the good of mankind. And yet they may have a multi-million dollar Swiss bank account. How do you explain that? Why should such a seeming contradiction not be such a surprise? Because they've had the attitude all along, self-interest and robbery are equivalent. That self-interest, that one man's gain is another man's loss. And that's what they believed. But they don't want to appear in public as saying, I'm an enemy <coughs> of the human race, because they wouldn't get very far. But if they believe that the way you serve your self-interest is through robbery, then what's going to happen if and when they ever decide to serve their self-interest? They'll be robbers. We shouldn't be so surprised. That's what they thought all along. Only up till now, they've never said they would serve their self-interest. They've always said they want to be a doormat for the rest of the human race. They're selflessly sacrificing themselves for the good of mankind. But their idea all along is that self-interest is robbery. Well, any time you find someone with a, a negative, consistently negative view of self-interest, you should stop and ask yourself, what would ever happen if this person should decide to act on his self-interest? He keeps saying he never would, he never does, wouldn't think of it. But anyone who thinks that self-interest, anyone who buys the idea that one man's gain is another man's loss, what is implied if he should ever decide to act for his own gain? Pardon me? Yeah, watch out, because he thinks that the way he needs to serve his self-interest is by uh, committing something against other people. Now, uh, in a society that, can, that thinks of self-interest as evil, uh, what you will have is the uh, private, secret, dark pursuit of self-interest uh, by means of force, uh, robbery, and at the same time, the total public condemnation of it and there'd be virtually uh, little or no open pursuit of self-interest. A society that turns against self-interest in public 
is a society of secret thieves, all uh, talking about their uh, morality and dedication to self-sacrifice, but they believe that the way you pursue self-interest is through theft, and uh, again and again, uh, there'll be people who act that way. Now, uh, it was uh, uh, perhaps only in the 17th and 18th century uh, that uh, philosophers began to realize that uh, there is a very different, radically different, positive dimension of self-interest. Self-interest as a benevolent force, but that means self-interest under freedom. And that's how the philosophers of the Enlightenment understood self-interest. That's how people like uh, Adam Smith understood self-interest. That's how uh, the great tradition of economists understands self-interest. Self-interest uh, with force and fraud off the table. Then uh, there is room for self-interest, but it's by positive, productive means. And that's what uh, generated the wealth of the world. Yes. Okay. Um, on that thought, like Adam Smith in particular, I remember reading him in my undergraduate, and we spent a particular amount of time talking about how he described motivation as the golden hand of capitalism. Invisible hand. The invisible hand of capitalism. Yeah. Which I remember this very clearly because that was a great point because of your book on secularism. Yeah. The interpretation that we discussed very heavily was that invisible hand was actually a Protestant definition of God. Okay. So you're asking, how does this relate to uh, secularism? Yeah. Okay. Adam Smith uh, said, uh, in talking about the benevolent outcome of self-interest, he had a statement, uh, again and again, individuals, by pursuing their self-interest, um, serve the public good even though that was no part of their intention. And they serve it better uh, than those who openly avow uh, the public good as being their goal. And he said, it's as though they were led uh, by an invisible hand. Now that's purely metaphorical. Adam Smith did not really mean that uh, God is sitting up there looking down at the economic system and uh, making things work out this way. Uh, that's purely a metaphor. Uh, things work out this way uh, by virtue of the inner logical necessity of the situation. See, look, uh, here we are. Uh, Intel wants to raise its profits. If they can't go and point a gun at the heads of chip buyers, how do they get chip buyers to buy more of their chips or pay a premium price for them? They must offer a better chip, right? Now, is it that it's just arbitrary that they offer a better chip, that God makes them offer a better chip? Or are they offering a better chip because that is the logically necessary thing you have to do uh, to get people voluntarily to part with their chip dollars? Well, I, didn't, I didn't mean a literal translation of it, yeah. but I, I see underneath all of this ethic. Yeah. I, I see it as a, as a very Protestant ethic, a belief in a, a certain moral code that underlies everything. Well, there is, there is a, a moral code, and it may well be the case that uh, there's a large overlap uh, between this moral code and the convictions of various Protestant denominations. Uh, I, I'm not an authority on that, but uh, I'm quite willing to believe that. Uh, but I would say that uh, it's probably more likely the case that uh, the change in philosophy that occurred uh, had a spillover influence on uh, on theology. And uh, you can find this phenomenon going on uh, in other parts of the world today. Uh, a couple of decades ago, I, I spent a, a few days in Singapore, and I was uh, browsing through a bookstore there, and uh, they were making a conscious effort to reinterpret Buddhism in a way to make it consistent with life in the modern world. And so uh, I would imagine uh, you might find Buddhist philosophers uh, coming out with a reinterpretation of, of the traditional teachings of Buddhism uh, to make it uh, consistent with what you need to do to live in the modern world. Uh, you have people uh, doing the same thing here. Uh, there are people uh, like Michael Novak, uh, who's a, a philosopher, a Catholic philosopher, 
uh, who tries to convert uh, Catholic theologians uh, to be less opposed to free enterprise, to uh, reinterpret uh, different things in the Bible and uh, Catholic theology. Uh, so I don't think uh, it's a given uh, in the religion. Uh, there's all kinds of historical influences that have worked in different ways in different religions, and I think they uh, they move uh, with uh, philosophical currents. I just always saw capitalism and the economic derivation of one part of religion. Well. I don't know uh, the details of what uh, Luther was doing, but I would say that uh, uh, capitalism indirectly derives uh, very heavily uh, from what St. Thomas Aquinas uh, did. Uh, he, of course, uh, uh, is perhaps the, the uh, greatest of the Catholic theologians. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was responsible for uh, reintroducing the writings of Aristotle into the Western world. And so let me, this is what I discussed under point two, uh, the philosophical foundations of capitalism and economic activity, uh, starting with uh, secularism. If you're going to have any kind of uh, serious economic development, it's necessary that people believe that the material world in which they live has full reality, that it's not uh, some kind of shadow existence. I would just think, suppose people took very, very seriously the conviction that uh, our life in this world is simply a period of testing for an infinite afterlife. And the, the really important thing is the infinite afterlife and what goes on uh, in your 70 years or whatever of life in this world, and that's really very secondary. Well, to what extent would you be able to concentrate on improving your life in this world? I don't think you could give it uh, your full heart and mind, at the least. So that's one issue. Uh, Aristotle argued that uh, the material world that we perceive through our senses, that this world is fully real, uh, and we can trust its existence. A closely related acceptance of the principle of causality. Now suppose you believed that uh, everything uh, proceeds as a miracle. Uh, God is deciding from moment to moment uh, what event will happen uh, following whatever other event. Do you think it would be possible to have science in that environment? So you just think for a moment. Uh, a scientist is attempting to find the answer, to explain something. He almost never will find it on the first attempt. What is it that keeps the scientist working uh, attempt after attempt after attempt to find the answer to a question. What philosophical presuppositions <coughs> must be present in order for the activity of science to proceed? No, there's a law out there. That, that there is a law, that nature has regularity, that nature operates according to cause and effect, and that our minds are capable of grasping such principles. We have to believe that the human brain has the ability to understand regularities that exist out there in nature. Now, if we thought there are no regularities, or if there are, we can't figure out what they are, then could we have science? No. no. And if we couldn't have science, could we have technology? No. Well, in order to have science and technology, it's necessary to have uh, these philosophical uh, presuppositions that nature operates according to definite regularities and that our minds are capable of grasping them. Well, Aristotle uh, taught both things, and Thomas Aquinas, in reintroducing Aristotle, uh, brought those attitudes uh, back into the Western world. Then also, uh, the acceptance of causality underlies uh, economic activity in other important ways, too, uh, such things as uh, the willingness to work hard, uh, the willingness to save and provide for the future. In order for people to work hard, and save and provide for the future, they have to have a certain view of themselves in relation to the world. They have to view themselves as uh, causal agents capable of achieving uh, results that they want to achieve. Now suppose you thought of yourself as utterly helpless, a ship uh, floating uh, on the waves, uh, and you're bounced back and forth 
by currents beyond your control. What could you attempt to accomplish? Nothing. Well, in order for people uh, to uh, do such things as work hard, attempt to solve problems, uh, save and provide for the future, they have to view themselves as effective causal agents. And that's a philosophical attitude. Uh, uh, further, point C, uh, acceptance of the power of reason. Uh, consequent view of man and the individual as valuable and competent. Now, uh, just think, uh, what is it that distinguishes us from all of the other animal species? The fact that we possess reason. That's why we say we're higher uh, than the dolphins and tuna fish and even cats and dogs. Now, uh, suppose uh, we did not uh, attach much significance to reason. Suppose, and there have been philosophers in history who have said uh, reason is a trap and a snare. It makes things look logical, but in the last analysis, it's all chaos. So suppose uh, we didn't attach uh, any significant positive valuation to reason. What would that imply about our valuation uh, of the status of human beings compared to other species? we wouldn't see much difference. And I think that's actually happened. Uh, you find today uh, a, a, a widespread uh, attitude, uh, well, there are uh, blacks and Caucasians and giraffes and snail daughters, and we're all part of the biotic family. Uh, they're not seeing anything that unites human beings <coughs> and elevates them above uh, all other species. Uh, the whole animal rights movement, I think, uh, is, pre is founded on the idea that uh, reason doesn't represent a profound difference, the presence or absence of reason. Now, if we have a positive uh, view of reason, if we regard reason as reliable, as uh, the means, uh, the, a reliable uh, certain means of knowledge, and Aristotle taught uh, that reason provides knowledge with certitude, that's what Aquinas taught, and that we have the capacity to exercise it, well, that implies an elevated view of human beings, that human beings are regarded as above uh, the lesser species. Now, if further we regard reason as the possession of the individual human being, not the possession of the human race in the abstract, but the possession of each and every individual human being, what kind of attitude does that imply towards a human individual. We'll have a positive, respectful attitude because reason means, if reason is reliable, it means, uh, and valuable, it means that the individual human being is valuable and competent. He's able, uh, he's uh, above any other species by virtue of his possession of reason, and he's competent to live by virtue of his possession of reason. So we have a positive attitude, and this is just one step removed from the recognition of individual rights. The concept of individual rights arose, uh, became uh, powerful in the 18th century, the age of reason. It was a corollary of uh, the recognition of the value and power of reason and that the individual possessed it. And that's what underlay uh, such things as uh, our Bill of Rights. And also, uh, it's what underlies such things as uh, uh, great entrepreneurship, uh, great efforts of any kind by individuals. So, uh, what is it that would enable someone uh, to set out uh, to discover a new world or to revolutionize an industry? What kind of view of human potential is implied? That human beings can succeed on a grand scale. In order for someone like Columbus to set sail or uh, for someone uh, to revolutionize the, uh, the means of production uh, in any field, uh, you have to have a pretty elevated view of what it is possible for a human being to accomplish. Suppose instead your attitude was uh, you don't know if you can even get your next fix. 
That's uh, the maximum limit of what you're capable of. Well, how much uh, will such people uh, be led to attempt to achieve? Very, very little. Well, uh, everything in the last analysis comes down to uh, the cultural status of reason. It underlies science and technology. Uh, uh, you have to know there are laws of nature that we can discover. It underlies our view of man, uh, our recognition of individual rights, and uh, it limits uh, the degree of, of the undertakings we attempt to uh, carry out. So it's an essential foundation of all aspects of economic development. And uh, so many of our problems, I think, uh, derive from uh, growing philosophical distrust of the power of reason. Now, uh, in the last uh, few minutes, let me turn to uh, the very controversial character of economics and capitalism. Uh, I have a discussion uh, in capitalism. Let me see if I can uh, bring it up on screen. Now, this is on the profit motive. Uh, but everything else in capitalism is attacked too. Uh, money is uh, commonly condemned as the root of all evil. Competition is the law of the jungle, survival of the fittest, dog eat dog. Uh, economic inequality is thought of as the basis for class warfare. Uh, there is virtually no aspect of capitalism uh, that does not come in uh, for tremendous uh, attack. And I'd like to uh, try uh, briefly uh, to indicate uh, the reasons. Uh, uh, economics encounters a, a lot of difficulty. Uh, at one level, and this is uh, point B, economics versus unscientific personal observations. Uh, this is something that exists in other sciences too. For example, uh, in physics, uh, there are such phenomena as if you put a stick in water, the stick looks bent. It isn't bent, but it looks bent. If you're uh, looking up at the sky uh, morning to evening, uh, it appears that the sun goes around the earth. It rises in the east and sets in the west. Now, uh, uh, physics and astronomy uh, know that uh, the stick in the water is not bent, it's, uh, the appearance is explained by the way uh, light is refracted in water. And uh, the appearance of the uh, movement of the sun around the earth is explained by the rotation of the earth. Okay, now, uh, these are instances where uh, there is uh, uh, some level of conflict between superficial, unscientific observation and the uh, teachings of serious science. And there's a comparable level of, uh, of uh, difficulty in economics. For example, it may appear that machinery causes unemployment or that war causes prosperity. I would say these are uh, phenomena of uh, comparable uh, false appearance uh, as the uh, stick in the water, a stick being bent in the water and the uh, sun revolving around the earth. Uh, they can be explained uh, without too great difficulty. Uh, machinery does not cause unemployment. It changes the pattern of employment. Uh, war does not promote prosperity. Uh, just changes the pattern of activity. So that's one level of difficulty. Now, uh, in the history of physics and astronomy, uh, they also encountered a, a further level. Uh, when uh, Galileo uh, was explaining that the uh, Earth actually revolves around the sun rather than the sun around the Earth, uh, there was a further element beyond uh, naive observation, and that was uh, that Galileo's teaching was perceived as an attack on the whole foundation of theology. Because it was thought God has made uh, man the center, man is his highest creation, uh, the Earth his home, uh, is therefore the center of the universe, and so the sun must revolve around the earth, not the earth around the sun. So when Galileo argued that uh, 
the earth is revolving around the sun, that was being perceived as an attack on the foundations of received morality. And that made his uh, job much more difficult. He was uh, threatened uh, uh, with torture by the Inquisition. Now there's something similar uh, in economics. Uh, economics uh, has a very different view of self-interest than we have received uh, from traditional morality. What is the view of self-interest that we obtain from traditional morality? That's greed. That it's greed, that it's at, at best it's amoral, uh, more likely it's immoral. There's a very negative view of self-interest and the uh, positive virtue uh, from traditional morality is supposed to be self-sacrifice. Self-interest is thought to be evil, self-sacrifice good. But if you study economics and you see uh, how markets work and how the economy uh, prospers and functions, you cannot help but arrive at a radically different view of self-interest. Of course, you have to uh, be aware that we're talking about self-interest under freedom, meaning you cannot obtain, you cannot strive uh, to serve your self-interest through the initiation of force. That's out. Uh, we're only talking about the pursuit of self-interest by peaceful, voluntary means. That can't be stressed too strongly. But if you do make that distinction and you're looking at self-interest under freedom, then you have a view of self-interest that is very, very much at odds with uh, traditional morality. And that perception, I think, has created the greatest difficulties for economics, comparable uh, to Galileo uh, and the Inquisition. It's uh, perceived as more than an issue of the uh, particular science. It's perceived as something with enormous, uh, wider uh, moral uh, theological implications. But then economics has an even greater difficulty, one uh, which was never experienced uh, by astronomy or physics, and that is uh, it its problems are compounded uh, by, by what I refer to in point D as uh, economics versus irrational self-interest. Namely, there are many, many people who believe that uh, the way to pursue their self-interest is, in fact, by uh, committing robbery and fraud. They think that's how you serve your self-interest. Now, to the extent there are such people, what is the effect on the perception of self-interest? It reinforces the negative perception. Uh, to the extent that there are people who believe they can achieve their self-interest through force and they attempt to do so, uh, that feeds the, uh, the uh, assumption that self-interest is evil. They appear to be providing fresh evidence for it. It's as though uh, when Galileo presented his ideas, not only would there be uh, this uh, theological opposition that it's undermining uh, the foundations of theology, but imagine that there had been groups of people in Galileo's time who had some kind of positive vested interest in the, uh, in the sun revolving around the earth, in the idea that the sun revolves around the earth. Well, uh, we have something comparable uh, in the economic world. Uh, there are people who positively believe that their self-interest is served uh, by uh, the use of force or fraud. And to the extent uh, that there are such people, uh, they confirm or appear to confirm the idea that uh, self-interest is evil and self-sacrifice is the only thing moral. So, uh, it is really vital uh, to recognize uh, what kind of self-interest we're talking about. And then finally, uh, there's this last point, economics versus irrationalism. Uh, in order uh, to establish its propositions, uh, economics depends on chains of reasoning. Uh, people have to be willing uh, to start with premises and follow their logical uh, imp implications. Uh, but what happens if people don't trust the process of logic? Suppose they have the attitude, 
oh, you can prove anything. And what does that mean about your ability to prove anything? And what does it mean about people's willingness to follow chains of thought? Well, to the extent there are such attitudes, that's an added difficulty. Okay, well, let me pause here and uh, see what uh, reaction, if any, uh, I'm getting. Have I misstated anything of significance? You're not saying greed is good. It's not that the court and gecko. I mean, <laughs> well, you're saying self interest is good. Self interest is good. But it would depend on what you mean by greed. If you yeah. want to, uh, if, if by greed one means uh, one wants to serve one's self-interest uh, to the utmost extent, then I would accept the proposition: greed is good. But uh, that's not accepting uh, the, the character of uh, Gord Gecko. You see, it's all, it's all an issue. Uh, if uh, you're talking about self-interest uh, through peaceful, voluntary exchange to mutual benefit, well, isn't more of it better than less? Now, uh, the only problem is if uh, people start mixing in uh, the pursuit of self-interest uh, by the initiation of force. Uh, then that is wrong in any quantity. Okay, any uh, further questions or comments? All right, well then I hope to see you all two weeks from tonight. And please, please uh, send me an email with a reliable return email address. Include your home and office phone numbers and the way you want your name to appear on a nameplate. So, see you all in two weeks. Thanks, Professor. You're very welcome. Have a good night. See you later. Uh, let me ask first off if anyone has any questions from last week or the readings uh, for this week. It may be uh, I'm going to be sure to cover it, in which case I'll tell you uh, we'll get to, the, uh, get to it a little later. But uh, otherwise, uh, fire away. Who should I answer first? <laughs> yes. There was one comment in the book where it talked about, if I remember correctly, I'm not even mistaken, but where the Tennessee Valley projects yeah. were not necessary. Is that correct? Uh, it was not economically uh, necessary, at least as. Uh, as developed at the time, uh, it was done to help uh, provide employment. Right. Yeah. Why? I didn't understand. I couldn't figure in grasp why that was. Because it was my understanding that those were some of the those those jobs felt to push the economy and to get it done. Well, the test of whether or not something is uh, economically necessary is uh, whether or not it's profitable. And uh, any time uh, the government is involved, it, it appears necessary that the government do something, uh, it's almost inevitable that uh, private enterprise has found the, the project unprofitable and uh, rejects it for that reason. Now, uh, who knows, maybe uh, something similar to TVA could have been uh, done privately uh, had the electric power facilities uh, been put up uh, for private ownership, had, had, they, had they allowed private firms to uh, participate in the project from the beginning. I don't know. Yes? Uh, in that way, would you say the same for the New Deal? Yeah, well, the TVA was um, a showcase uh, aspect 
of the New Deal. Okay. So, yeah. so in that, because the argument is the opposite, it says that that is the stimulus, that that creates a, a job pool, and it certainly creates a, a demand set. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I hope to show, maybe even tonight, I would like to show it tonight, uh, is that, uh, in fact, uh, we do not have to create jobs. Uh, there's more work out there waiting to be done than we're capable of doing. And when you have a problem of mass unemployment, it's because of some artificial, unnecessary impediment uh, to people doing some larger fraction of the work that is out there waiting to be done. Uh, here I have a topic, scarcity. Uh, and then the ineradicability of scarcity, uh, point three, and uh, that it's not eliminated by more workers. Uh, you see, uh, this goes uh, to the question of what is the extent of our desire for wealth? What's the extent of our desire for goods and services? Uh, th pardon me? Limitless. It's limitless. Uh, just think whatever your income is now, would you have any great difficulty in living up to twice the income? And if it got to be twice the income, would you have a difficulty in living up to twice that? Now here's uh, Bill Gates, uh, who not so long ago was reportedly worth uh, $40 billion plus. Uh, does he have enough wealth uh, to satisfy every goal and project that he's interested in achieving? Not at all. Now, what is the essential requisite for the production of all wealth and the rendition of all services? What's the one essential item that's always needed? Yes? What do we need to produce anything or provide any service? What's the, yes, and you are? Resources. Pardon? Uh, the natural resources. Yeah, and your name is? Okay, now you say we need the natural resources. Okay, we have natural resources. What do we have to do to get them out of the ground? We have to apply labor. We have to apply labor. And one of the things uh, I also hope to show is that uh, there's always more natural resources, or virtually always, uh, more natural resources around uh, than we're able at any given time economically to exploit. So, for example, uh, do we uh, farm every acre that is capable of growing crops? No. Do we farm the acres that we do farm to the utmost limit of their possible output? Well, if you applied more labor and capital to the same plot of ground, you would almost always get additional output. But we don't apply uh, the labor and capital uh, to the utmost limit. Let me uh, jump to that right now. No reason why we have to follow uh, a definite order. Here I have a classic illustration of the law of diminishing returns. All right, here we are. This is a table in my book. And this is a kind of illustration you'd find in hundreds of textbooks uh, going back generations. Uh, we assume we have a piece of land of some definite amount, like a farm of 100 acres. And here we are. We could apply a one man year uh, to this farm, and we get a certain output, like 100 bushels. Uh, if we apply two man years, we would get a larger output, but uh, typically less than double. Now, these, this is for illustration only. Thank you. Uh, it might be you'd have an a case uh, you apply double the labor, you get more than double the output. But then if what will happen if we redouble the labor? Could we go on uh, doubling and redoubling the labor applied to the same land and always getting proportionate results or greater than proportionate results? No, at some point we get diminishing returns. Now, let's say they begin right away with the second man year. Now, already at this point, uh, if we had two man years available, uh, would it be a, a wise thing to do to employ two man years on this one uh, parcel of land, or if we had a second equally good parcel of land available, uh, to apply the second man year to that second parcel? Uh, does this uh, stop anyone from seeing when they're having doused that light? Yeah. Which would be more desirable, to have uh, 
two million years on two parcels or on one parcel? On two parcels. With two parcels, we would get a total output of 200 instead of 100. But now, if we have uh, sufficient land so that we don't have to employ so much labor down to the point where, let's say, the eighth worker uh, yields nothing extra, uh, here we are, we're uh, assuming the incremental output keeps diminishing by 10 for the sake of illustration. Well, maybe with a fifth worker, it would be 60, uh, a sixth worker, 50. Uh, would it be economical uh, just because we might employ 10 man years on this one parcel of land to do so? Not if we have additional land available. And if we are not at the absolute limit of output on a piece of land, then it's always possible to expand the output. What would be required to expand the output from the land we already work? Just more labor. More labor uh, can certainly increase the supply of practically any agricultural product. And the same is true in mining. Uh, we do not exploit every mine uh, to uh, the point where the application of additional labor yields nothing at all. Uh, we typically cut off the exploitation of a mine at a point uh, far, far short of the absolute limit of its productivity. An excellent illustration is the case of, of a typical uh, oil field. Um, uh, typically, the amount of oil that is extracted from a field uh, only amounts to roughly one-third of the oil that's physically down there. Now, it's possible to get uh, a third one-sixth, bring it up from a third to a half, but that third one-sixth uh, is uh, substantially more expensive per unit than the first two-sixths. Why? Because you have to adopt uh, more sophisticated methods. Uh, you have to uh, 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 flood the, uh, the, the field or uh, inject chemicals, uh, possibly start a fire underground. Uh, it takes a lot more uh, to get that third one-sixth. If the price of oil is high enough, we do it. But uh, typically, if the oil wells, if the oil fields are there, uh, it's more economical uh, to employ uh, uh, three fields, uh, each to the extent of one-third, then uh, two fields to the extent of half. Uh, now, why would this be so? Well, with the same labor applied to three fields uh, rather than uh, uh, concentrated on two, we get a greater output. The same labor, uh, here we have, it's, the principle is right up here, if we have two man years, two man years applied to two parcels of land produce more than two man years applied to one parcel of land. Very similarly, uh, the same amount of labor applied in oil production or extraction of uh, crude oil uh, will produce more crude oil uh, when it's applied uh, to the extent of only getting a third of the output out of three fields rather than a half of the output out of two. And uh, similar uh, uh, principles apply uh, in iron mining, uh, sulfur mining, uh, just about anything. So it is possible uh, to step up the production of virtually any mineral from uh, already known and exploited deposits uh, by exploiting them more intensively. And then beyond that, uh, there's always land and deposits which we know about but don't exploit at all because the yield would be too low. And this is also very closely related uh, to diminishing returns. You can view it as another aspect of diminishing returns. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to bite the bullet here and uh, get back the outline. Um, I have a reference here. Uh, right under the heading of Law of Diminishing Returns, uh, following the uh, illustration I just gave you. Uh, Ricardo and grades of land of decreasing quality. Now, uh, 
here we are. We have uh, the, the same sort of illustration uh, as I just gave you. Here it is. I think this is pretty much the same illustration carried one step further. Can you guys see this in the back? Okay, now, uh, in the case of agricultural land and mines, uh, there are uh, lands and mines of different degrees of quality, different degrees of productivity. Uh, as far as we're aware of these differences, uh, which do you think we want to exploit first? Which would you rather exploit uh, if you were a mining company, a uh, more productive mine uh, that can be operated at a lower cost, or a less productive mine that requires a higher cost? Or if you're in farming, a more productive farm uh, that produces at a lower cost, or a less productive one that produces at a higher cost? I would say obviously the more productive. So as far as people are aware of differences and have the ability to choose, uh, they choose to exploit uh, the most productive sources first. So uh, people would prefer to produce on land of the first quality, that's the most productive, uh, where the output of the same labor is 100, and then uh, only when all the land of the first or best quality had been brought under cultivation would they turn to land of the second quality, where the output is 90. And until all of the land of the second quality were under cultivation, uh, no one would bother to farm land of the third or fourth quality. And, and uh, the same applies to uh, mining. Uh, why uh, has only recently uh, the, uh, the tar sands up in Alberta uh, come under uh, heavy exploitation uh, for their oil? You know, there's oil found in Alberta uh, in the form of tar sands, uh, but it's apparently not profitable to extract oil from these tar sands unless the price of petroleum is above $30 a barrel, which it has been now for a little while, uh, but it would not pay at uh, $25 a barrel. So if the price of oil were $25 a barrel, uh, would such uh, high-cost uh, petroleum deposits be exploited? No, they'd be left idle. Now, uh, there are always uh, such deposits that we know about that could be exploited or uh, deposits that we are exploiting that could be exploited more intensively, but uh, it's an issue of the, the cost of doing it versus the price of the product. But uh, the implication is that uh, even in the case of minerals, uh, there is hardly any mineral whose production we could not step up in fairly short order uh, from uh, already known sources. Now, what would be what would be required to step up the production? What would be the fundamental element that we would have to apply uh, more heavily? Labor. Essentially, it would be labor. Uh, it's labor directly uh, on the sp on the land or the, the in the mine, and more labor uh, to produce whatever tools or materials might be required uh, in exploiting the land. So uh, the limiting element uh, is really labor, and uh, there is virtually no limit to how much uh, overall products and services we'd like to have. So you just think of it this way, uh, we'd all like to be able to have double the income. We wouldn't have any difficulty figuring out how to spend double the income. But uh, what would be the limiting element uh, required to produce uh, double the actual goods and services? It would be labor. Uh, the implication is there's really a fundamental scarcity of labor. Labor is the underlying fundamental scarce element. And that's why, so I'm, uh, uh, perhaps uh, jumping ahead here, uh, on the one side, we have a virtually limitless desire and need for wealth. On the other side, the fundamentally limiting factor in our ability to produce it is human labor. And labor uh, is always limited. Uh, just think, uh, at any given time, there are only so many people able to work. They have a limited capacity to work, and they don't want to work to their capacity. They also want to have leisure. So what is the basic uh, solution to this problem of having an unlimited need and desire for the products of labor, 
but limited labor to produce those products. What do we have to do to get more and more products and services from the same labor? This is where I was having a little bit of trouble connecting. There are two examples of countries that I've been in that have a surplus of talent mm -hmm. within what we call the middle class. And it seems to me as though it's a labor class that's yet to be packed in. We have both of these, I'm thinking Brazil and Morocco. Yeah. We have two very educated middle classes in yeah. these countries, yet they both have a tremendously high level of unemployment to mm -hmm. talent. Yeah. And subsequently have extremely challenged economy. Mm -hmm. The only sense that I can make of this was that using New Zealand as an example, that it's an, it's almost the question seems to be, but the answer seems to be the institutionalized discipline, right? To create a opportunity set, to create a pathway to deploy this labor against. Because in a lazy and fair hands off, this is what happened. They said and they're very well educated and they don't have jobs to go. Okay, you say that uh, you're familiar with Brazil and Morocco, and they have uh, substantial unemployment, and they have uh, an educated class, and then there's a mass of uh, uneducated people, many of whom are unemployed, and uh, you think that what is necessary to solve that problem is some type of New Deal arrangement, and that what they now have is a kind of laissez-faire arrangement, uh, which explains uh, why they're mired in the situation they're in. I'd probably describe it a little more broadly. I wouldn't say that they have, I wouldn't attribute it to ways of fair. I'd attribute it to the fact that there has been no defined discipline system that would create opportunities to employ the talent. When you say no defined discipline, uh, I, I'm not, I don't think I understand what that means. I would say that uh, what their underlying problem there is that. Uh, uh, people cannot uh, produce, uh, they cannot inaugurate uh, significant production projects uh, with any kind of uh, security for property rights. Uh, you have in these places, uh, as a minimum, extremely corrupt governments, uh, if not worse. And uh, what is required to uh, uh, launch any kind of significant project and employ any significant number of people? What would you have to do to be able to do that? Could you uh, just uh, open up a business and offer jobs to people? Or do you think uh, you'd first need all kinds of approvals and permissions and take on all kinds of governmental partners? Uh, that's why uh, they're paralyzed. Uh, the incentive uh, to conduct these projects uh, that would employ uh, substantial numbers of people and eliminate this problem uh, that is uh, is aborted. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Is, I'm sorry, is it fair? To say that the division of labor in those such countries is not developed? The division of labor, is it fair to say the division of labor in those countries is not developed? I would say it's uneven. Uh, it would depend on what part you were talking about. Uh, there are parts of Brazil that are fully integrated into the division of labor. Uh, the city of Sao Paulo and its uh, surroundings, uh, probably Rio de Janeiro and, and other areas. Uh, uh, there are probably other parts in the interior that are not very well integrated. Uh, I suspect Morocco has less integration than uh, Brazil. But uh, you see, uh, just compare uh, the degree of needs and wants in those countries uh, with their ability to satisfy those needs and wants. Now, uh, it may be that uh, a factor that contributes to their unemployment is that uh, their productivity of labor is so miserably low, uh, they produce so little per capita, that it might be economical uh, to employ such people only at uh, wages too low for them to live at. But uh, there is a need for their labor. Uh, the problem is it's really not sufficiently productive uh, to make it possible to, to employ too many of them. Can I continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you, you've indicated the major attribute is systemic in the sense that the, the corruption of them, right? Well, that's a leading part of it. Uh, the lack, I would say, the lack of respect for property rights, the lack of a clear rule of law, 
uh, and whatever uh, problems there are in the culture that perpetuate that. So in a, in a pure hands-on capitalist approach, mm. how do you counter something that clearly needs to be broken? How would it be countered? Well, I would say uh, the way it's being countered right now, uh, without a fully capitalist approach, but one that's uh, substantially moving in that direction, uh, in important provinces of China. Uh, when uh, China uh, opened its economy, or parts of its economy at any rate, uh, to the rest of the world, uh, what, what has happened? I mean, here you are, you have uh, tens and hundreds of millions of uh, uh, people able and willing to work, and uh, they start off at uh, miserably low wages. Uh, what opportunity does that uh, provide uh, to businessmen elsewhere in the world? To come in and take advantage of that, and as they do, uh, what happens to the demand for labor? It goes up. Uh, what happens to wage rates? That goes up. And what happens to the ability of uh, local Chinese or whoever might be in the country? Uh, what as uh, their incomes go up and as they uh, see opportunities of an entrepreneurial nature, uh, what happens uh, to, to their ability to save and accumulate capital? That goes up. Now, uh, what would have happened had, instead of uh, Deng Xiaoping, I think his name was, instead of uh, uh, him becoming the uh, head of China in the early 1980s, uh, suppose uh, someone in the exact same mold as Mao Zedong had uh, uh, assumed the leadership and continued the same policies as Mao. Uh, what difference do you think that would have made to the Chinese economy? I would say they'd be back where they were uh, under Mao. But uh, freeing up the economy, even to the extent it has been freed up, uh, has uh, brought about incredible progress. Now, they still have a very, very long way to go. But if they were to continue the progress they've had for the last 20 years at the same rate for the next 20, 30, or 40 years, then uh, China, at the end of that period, uh, would be at a level, the same kind of level as Japan, and close to, if not ahead of the United States. So uh, that's uh, essentially what they need. And uh, it is uh, uh, the closer uh, to laissez-faire, uh, uh, understood as uh, the government uh, providing 